Lecture 4, Processes. Early computers, uh, as well as a number of modern embedded systems, did exactly one thing, or at the very least, exactly one thing at a time. Uh, and at that time, the program that was running had access to all the resources available in the system, so managing resources wasn't such a big problem. Now, of course, your modern operating system supports many different programs running concurrently. Uh, you would not accept it as okay, for example, if you had to close an application before you were allowed to open another in your operating system, even on your phone. Like That wouldn't work. You want to be able to have multiple things open at the same time, uh, even if you might only be paying attention to one at this very moment. Uh, certain things do need to be able to continue in the background. So to manage this complexity, the operating system uses the concept of a process, uh, and we have, of course, already worked with them, but we may not simply have known that at the time. Uh, the formal definition of a process is it is a program in execution, and it is composed of three things. Number one, the instructions and the data. Uh, so uh, notably, the compiled executable is the program, uh, and that is only one part of the process. The current state, uh, that is where we are in execution of this uh, process, uh, and any resources that are needed to execute, and that's files, that's memory, that's anything that counts as a resource uh, that is open or in use during execution. Uh, and if we have two instances of the same program running, those are two distinct processes. So you can have two windows open for Microsoft Word, even though they're the same program, it's the same executable file, word.exe or equivalent, they are considered different processes because they are at different points in their execution. They are managed separately by the operating system. They share the executable program, but that's only one part of the process. Similarly, two users who both use Firefox, the browser, at the same time on a terminal server, they also have two different processes. Again, same program, but different processes. So here we have uh, two documents here uh, that are open on, on the left side is you know, some text, document one on the right side is some text, document two. Uh, and they are, of course, distinct because they are completely different in uh, their state. Uh, you can be editing in one of them on the right side and it doesn't affect what's going on on the left because they are different processes. We're going to take a slight detour to the behind the scenes view of how the operating system manages a process just so we can have a little bit of a mental model of what's happening when a program is executing. The operating system's data structure for this is the process control block, uh, and it is a data structure containing what the operating system needs to know about that program in order for it to run. Uh, it will be created uh, and updated by the operating system for every running process, and it can also be thrown away when that process is no longer running, when it's finished executing and everything has been cleaned up. Uh, and these blocks uh, of process control blocks, that is, are held in memory uh, and maintained in some container, a list, or some such um, by the operating system kernel. The process control block is how uh, the operating system is going to think about it in terms of scheduling. Uh, it's also how it makes sure that if you forget to deallocate memory, that memory gets cleaned up when it is no, when the process is no longer running. Same thing, you know, files are automatically closed. It's all managed through the process control block. Uh, and a process control block will usually contain uh, the following fields. So it has an identifier. Uh, this is a unique ID associated with the process, and that's usually a simple integer, uh, and it will be incremented when a new process is created, reset when the system is rebooted. Uh, we will see later in Unix that identifier is just a simple integer. Uh, they can eventually get reused, but they are at least relatively unique. That is, two processes can't have the same identifier at the same time. State. The current state of the process. We're going to spend some more time later talking about state specifically, uh, but you can think of it for now as to is it running, is it waiting for something. Uh, the state is probably the most important thing that we want to take away from this discussion. Priority, how important this process is, and that's relative to others. 
program counter and register data show up on here with little asterisks. Uh, that's because they are not kept up to date constantly. They're updated only when needed. Uh, so the process control block is a place where the current program counter, that is where we are, what is our current instruction, what is our next instruction, uh, and the register data, the values that go in the registers, can be stored when switching between processes. Uh, and memory pointers, this allows the operating system to keep track of what memory has been allocated to this process or by this process. Uh, I.O. status information, are we waiting for anything? Uh, are we, you know, do we have a file open? Are we waiting for an I.O. operation? Is a device assigned to this? Uh, and then there is accounting information, so this is data about the process's use of resources. In a technical sense, it's optional, but basically every operating system will have it. Uh, the idea being that we have to keep track of how much CPU time it has used and uh, what resources it's uh, consuming, uh, because those sorts of things are helpful uh, and may be used in scheduling policy as well as in just making sure the system is working for multiple users. Now, on an ECE uh, run server, we could have hundreds and hundreds of users and accounting information is used to make sure that no one user is monopolizing the time of the system. If you wanted a uh, simplified visual representation of that, the process control block, it's just you know, a sequence of fields, uh, and it can be as many fields as are needed. Uh, and as I said, everything is kept up to date with uh, the exception of program counter and register data. They have little asterisks next to them. Uh, and when the program is running, you don't update those values every time. However, it will be uh, used when a system call or process switch occurs. Uh, and this is how we effectively store and restore the state of the program uh, as the operating system. So save the state of the process into the process control block. Uh, so the program counter variable and the register variables. Uh, and we'll end up with some workflow that looks a little bit like this. So here is a sequence showing that process P0 is executing here at the beginning of time, uh, and there will be an interrupt or system call of some sort. Uh, save the state for this process into its process control block, uh, and uh, in the three dots here, the operating system is doing whatever it needs to do. Um, that may be uh, carrying out a system call. It might be the scheduler is running. Uh, the scheduler, in this case, will decide that process control block one is going to execute, uh, and so it will reload the state from process control block one and restart process P1. P1 will then continue and execute for some period until it gets to an interrupt, say it's a, a system call, uh, or maybe it is a timer interrupt that its uh, slice of time in which it gets to execute has expired, uh, and we will save the state. Again, operating system will take some actions, you know, decide which process should run next, reload the state from process control block zero, and then execution resumes uh, here on process P0. Uh, as you can see, um, there is uh, a large amount of time when neither process P0 nor P1 is executing. This is generally undesirable, and the goal of the operating system, as we discussed, is to let your programs run. It's not supposed to focus its time on running itself. It's supposed to help other programs to execute. Uh, and so it's important in operating system design to try to minimize the amount of time that it takes to do things like decide which process is going to be next to run, uh, because ultimately the useful work uh, that's being done is quite limited in this diagram. If you add up the blue arrows for P0 and P1 and you compare it to the total fraction of time that's represented, it's not great. So we would prefer, uh, all things being equal, to have fewer interrupts and to have the operating system do less. But obviously we know some things cannot be avoided. Okay. And processes have a circle of life. Uh, unlike energy, processes may be both created and destroyed. Uh, upon creation, the operating system creates a new process control block for that process and will initialize its data. Uh, this means set the variables to their initial values, what is the initial program state, uh, and the instruction pointer is moved to the first instruction in main, uh, and then the process control block is added to the set. Uh, after the program is terminated, we can collect some data, you know, a summary of the accounting information if needed, uh, and we can remove the process control block from the list of active processes and then carry on. There are generally speaking three events that lead to the creation of a process. Number one is system boot up, so some things are started kind of automatically when you start 
the computer or when you log in. Uh, some are by user request. Uh, so you as a user say, I want you to open the text editor or you uh, ask it to start the compiler. That's creation of a process by user request. Uh, and then there is one process spawns another without direct user intervention. So at boot up, when the computer starts, the operating system begins running and it creates some processes. If it is an embedded system, you know, it is the anti-lock brakes controller in a car, then whatever processes, if there are any other than the uh, main one, uh, it has all the processes it will ever need. Uh, uh, NASA Mars Lander might have the same thing. Uh, it has uh, five processes that it's going to run and they're all started at the beginning of the operating system boot up and there are no more and there's no other way to start them because they should always be running. A general purpose operating system, you know, your typical desktop or laptop or phone operating system, allows at least one but almost certainly both of the other ways. First uh, is users and second is processes spawning another. But uh, some processes, regardless really of how they're started, uh, will be in the foreground and some in the background. Uh, and the difference between this is basically can you as a user interact with it directly? So a login process, uh, the login screen where it presents, you know, please enter your username and password, that's user visible and we would say it is foreground. If you open a PDF viewer, that is a foreground process because you can see there is a window on your desktop in which the PDF is being shown. That's a foreground uh, user interactive process. There are also background processes which you don't interact with directly, but you can interact with using some client. So if you have a server that shares media on the local network, uh, that's a background process. Uh, the Unix term for this background process is daemon or daemon. As far as I can tell, both pronunciations are considered acceptable. Uh, and a good example that you should at least have tried out if you did the GitLab setup stuff by now is the secure shell daemon. So if you want to log into a system, say EC Ubuntu, you use your client, the SSH client, the command for which is SSH, your username at this, uh, this URL or this address. Uh, and on the receiving side, there is a background process, the secure shell daemon, uh, and it is awaiting incoming connections. When you attempt to connect, your SSH client connects to the remote SSH daemon, uh, and it responds to your connection attempt by saying, you know, please provide your username and password, uh, and verifies those, and if they are valid, then it connects you to a session. Okay, users are well known for um, doing whatever they want uh, without necessarily uh, consulting with you uh, or without the uh, approval of operating system designers. Um, so every time you double click an icon, enter a command uh, on the command line, like SSH, it results in the creation of a process. This image like really makes me sad because like how could you ever find anything in this horribly disorganized mess but users can do that even if it's not what the um even if it's not what the designers of the operating system intended um uh, okay i can't look at this anymore we have to go on um the last thing uh, and this is what we're going to really spend our time on uh, in in this course is the idea of processes creating another so an already executing process can create one um, if you get an email and the email contains a link, first of all, you should never click it. Um, it is you know, dangerous and unsafe to click links in your email and you shouldn't do that. And so my security advice is don't. But if someone did, not you, you wouldn't make this mistake, but if someone clicked the link in the email, uh, then the email program isn't a web browser and it wouldn't try to render the web page the way a web browser does because it doesn't really make sense for it to do a thing that's not its job. So what it will actually do is start the web browser. Uh, it will say, hey, uh, this isn't my area. I would like a different program to handle this. And that would actually work. Now, a program can break its work up into different logical parts uh, without necessarily being, oh, we need to invoke a different program altogether. We can say, well, we're going to split our one single program uh, into, say, you know, a, a client and a server part. And this could be used to either promote parallelism, the idea of getting more work done uh, at the same time, uh, or fault tolerance. So if the client crashes, we can restart the client, and that's fine. The server remains up. Uh, when that happens, uh, we are thinking about creating a new process 
programmatically, so from within an already executing process, uh, and that's sometimes referred to as spawning. The process that creates the child is the parent, and the newly created one is the child. Uh, we'll return uh, specifically to the subject of relations between processes in Unix uh, a little bit later on, um, but just keep in mind that there is a parent and child relationship between processes when spawning occurs. Eventually, most processes do die. I mean, some of them continue on for basically ever, but uh, you know, or until system shutdown, but they can die. This can happen in one of four ways, uh, and uh, some of them are good and some of them are bad. There's normal exit, which is voluntary, error exit, which is voluntary, a fatal error, which is involuntary, and a process can also be killed by another process, which we would also consider to be involuntary. So most of the time, the process finishes because it's actually done, right? Uh, or the user asks them to. Uh, if I was editing a document in Notepad and I said save and exit, when I clicked on exit, that's a voluntary normal exit. Uh, you know, this is a normal voluntary termination. Why is it voluntary? Because I chose it. You know, the program it didn't encounter an error. It's not unexpected. And it's a normal exit because it's not an error. I just said, I'm done now. I've finished editing this document. I'm going to exit. Uh, sometimes you don't, as a user, have to make that specific choice. Uh, when the compiler finishes compilation, it terminates normally. It got to the end of doing all the stuff for compilation, and it says, yes, I'm done now, and I'm going to exit. That's great. Uh, and we should expect that most of the time, that is what happens. Now, sometimes there is a voluntary exit, but with an error. Uh, and we already saw a code example of this where if you attempt to run the read file program but you specify an invalid file, it will exit with return negative one. That's an error exit, but it's voluntary. The program has said, well, I don't want to go on under these circumstances, so I'm going to choose to exit. Uh, and that can happen for lots of reasons. Uh, if the user tries to run a program and it requires write access to a temporary directory and you don't have permissions, uh, it may exit voluntarily with an error code. Uh, and in whatever scenario we are imagining, it's a voluntary error exit if the program chooses itself to terminate, that is not continue, because of an error, uh, and that's voluntary because the program has made this decision. Then there is the involuntary error exit, uh, and that is a fatal error has occurred in the program. So if you have a stack overflow error, a division by zero, segmentation fault, anything like that, um, something has gone wrong in the program. The operating system has detected the error, segmentation fault being we've tried to read memory that doesn't belong to us, or division by zero being you know, an arithmetic problem. Uh, and this often results in involuntary termination of the offending program. It's not that we chose to exit, it's just we have stumbled across this error and we don't know how to handle it so the program is terminated. A process can of course tell the operating system that it wants to handle some kinds of errors with you know try catch kind of behavior uh, in which case the operating system still delivers the error to the program which will hopefully be able to deal with it. Uh, if not then the unhandled exception or error does still result in the involuntary termination. You can catch these kinds of errors and then just proceed to a voluntary termination if you want. It gives you an opportunity to clean up a bit or you know, print some helpful error messages before you exit. Uh, but that would change the type from involuntary, where you know, it just dies due to this invalid request, to a voluntary exit where you said, well, I observed an invalid request, but I'm now going to choose to tell you about it before voluntarily quitting. And the final reason for termination is that processes may kill one another. So yeah, uh, murder is a thing in the process world. Is no one safe? Typically, this is actually a user request. Uh, a program is stuck or consuming too much CPU. You know, the user opens Task Manager uh, or looks uh, in Unix with the PS command to get a list of processes. Uh, and then you choose to kill it because you think it's stuck, you think it's taking too long. Now, that's not the only way to do it. Um, programs can, without user intervention, kill other processes. If a parent process decides uh, it no longer needs the result from a child process or it thinks a child process is taking too long and it's stuck, it can use the kill command to actually terminate that other process. That's kind of grim, sorry. 
There are obviously restrictions uh, on killing processes, and that is a user or process has to have the rights to execute the victim. Uh, typically, as a user, you may only kill a process that belongs to you, one that you have created, uh, with the obvious exception of a system administrator. Killing processes might be fun, but it's something that should be reserved only for when it is actually needed. Um, in some operating systems, when you uh, kill a process, it also kills uh, all the child processes. Um, that's really cruel. Um, neither Unix nor Windows works that way. Uh, in, in Unix, a parent can outlive the death of its child and vice versa. Now, in Unix, but not in Windows, the relationship between the parent process and the child process, or processes plural, uh, is maintained forming a tree based hierarchy. Uh, and a process, unlike most plants and animals, reproduces asexually. You could think of it as being kind of more like an amoeba in that it like divides in two identical pieces uh, as opposed to anything more resembling like parent and child. It's more like it just divides itself like an amoeba or bacteria or something like that. Uh, a process has exactly one parent, and it can have zero or more children. Uh, and a process and all of its descendants uh, form a process group, and certain operations like sending signals, signals are a topic we will come back to when we talk about inter-process communication, can be sent to a group as opposed to just an individual process. Now, in Unix, the first process is usually called init, uh, although in some systems init has been replaced with systemd same purpose. It's just a question of uh, which implementation you have. Uh, and this is eventually uh, in the hierarchy the parent of all processes in the same way that the object class in Java is the superclass of all classes. If you send up the class hierarchy far enough, uh, everything is a subclass of object. Uh, and in that same way, uh, if you go to the parent process of your current process, uh, repeatedly you will eventually reach init or system D. Uh, and that means in Unix you may represent all processes using a tree structure. That's not the case in Windows. Uh, in Windows, a process that spawns another gets a reference to the child, which allows it to exercise a little bit of control over the child, but uh, this reference can be given to another process, meaning that uh, the concept of adoption exists in Windows, but not in Unix, uh, and there isn't really a strong hierarchy, whereas in Unix, a process cannot disinherit a child. It can't say, oh, uh, pretend I don't exist anymore. Now, when a process terminates, it does so with a return code, and we saw that previously in some code examples where we, you know, we return zero at the end of main, or we return negative one if something goes wrong. Uh, if you just run it on the command line, you know, dot slash uh, a out, uh, it is ignored. Uh, the return value is there, but it's uh, not used for anything. Uh, same thing if you double click on an icon uh, in your operating system's graphical user interface, and it starts the process, but you don't see the return code. However, in Unix, uh, programmatically, the parent process can get the code that the child process returns, if you want. Uh, it is, as the case with a lot of system calls, uh, usually convention that return value of zero indicates success, and other values will indicate an error of some sort. Normally, there is some sort of understanding between the parent and the child process about what a particular code means. There's no like, strong definitions about, well, you know, does 5 mean this or does 10 mean that? Uh, those kinds of things are uh, not necessarily determined anywhere except as agreement between the parent process and the child process, most of which you probably wrote uh, yourself or in your team anyway. Fear the walking dead. Okay. When a child process finishes until the parent collects the return value, the child process continues in a state of undeath that's referred to as a zombie process. Now, this doesn't mean that the process shuffles around the system attempting to eat the brains of other processes, entertaining as that might be. It just means the process is dead but not gone. There's still an entry in the PCB list and the process holds on to its allocated resources, uh, and it's really only after the return value has been collected by a parent, then that uh, PCB and all of its associated stuff can be collected. Uh, usually a child's 
uh, process's result is eagerly awaited by its parent, and there is a system call which we will examine soon, uh, the wait system call, which collects the value right away. Uh, this allows for the trial to be cleaned up, or if you want, like, extra grim terminology for it, reaped. Uh, there is the possibility of some delay for some reason. Uh, if that's the case, the process is a zombie for some amount of time until that value is collected. So seeing a zombie process in the list isn't necessarily bad. It just means that this has finished and it hasn't yet been collected, and you know, that should happen sooner or later. If it doesn't happen for a long time, that's concerning. Uh, it means somewhere a parent process has failed to collect a result from a child, but that is usually fixable. Now, if a parent process dies before the child does, then the child process is called an orphan. Uh, and in Unix, any orphan process is automatically adopted by init, or systemd, which makes sure eventually that all processes have a good home. Uh, the default behavior of init in this scenario is to just collect the uh, return values from child processes and do nothing with them, thus allowing them to be cleaned up. Uh, and you can, of course, choose if you wish to intentionally orphan a uh, program. It allows it to run in the background. That might be cruel, uh, except, of course, processes, as far as anyone knows, do not have feelings. Now, as you might imagine, at any given time, a process has a certain state, uh, and in the simplest possible view, we would say that the process is either running or not running. Um, so if we were to develop a model of what does the process state look like, uh, the first two states of the model are probably running and ready. That doesn't account for everything that we already know about. Um, for example, a, a program that requests a resource uh, might not get it right away, uh, and that gives us the blocked state. So based on what we know about processes already, it could be running, it could be ready, to run but not actually running right now so it's waiting its turn uh, or it could be blocked it can't run right now because it is missing some resource or something that it needs we did not however cover in this three-state model the concept of zombies uh, and just as a life pro tip uh, if you've watched enough zombie movies you will know that the character who doubts that zombies are real is the one who dies first and therefore it is in your self-interest to always believe in zombies so we need a state to represent that as well, uh, otherwise uh, our model doesn't match what we already know. Uh, and we can't use blocked for this because the process is finished, but its value is not yet collected. Uh, but it's also not ready to run, and it's not waiting for a resource either, so it wouldn't really make sense to call it, uh, call it blocked. So we need a new state for that, and that would be terminated. Okay. Uh, you might have noticed if you were paying attention to the titles of the slides that uh, it says five state model and we have thus far only covered four. So spoiler alert, there is in fact a fifth state. Uh, and the fifth state is new, that is just created. If the user creates a process, the operating system does have some work to do, like define an identifier, instantiate the process control block, and put it into the new state, uh, all that sort of stuff. The operating system uh, has created it, but it hasn't really started it yet, and it hasn't committed itself to the uh, actual execution of this process. Um, this could be because the operating system limits the number of concurrent processes for performance reasons, and you can't start 10,000 things uh, because it would slow down the system too much. So a process that's in the new state is kind of waiting its turn, waiting for there to be available uh, time in which to run it. So uh, the other thing is new processes are typically on disk uh, and not loaded into memory. So uh, if the process is, we've acknowledged the request, but nothing has happened with it yet, we haven't actually loaded the program into memory or anything, then the new state is appropriate for that. So with our states, at, uh, as we've discussed them so far, we have running, ready, blocked, new, and terminated. Uh, and if we look at the transitions between them, uh, when we create a new process, it goes to new. When it's going to be prepared to be started, we can put it in the ready state. Uh, when the scheduler chooses to run it, its dispatch transition puts it in running. It could get blocked or it could be suspended. Uh, and 
Uh, it could be finished, so it goes to exit. Now, this diagram is missing a couple of additional exit transitions. Uh, a process that's in the ready or blocked state could transition directly to the terminated state. Uh, if a process is killed, uh, um, for some reason, even if it was blocked, that moves it straight to terminated, uh, and it just prevents uh, cluttering up this diagram too much. And there are H transitions uh, in the diagram, create, admit, dispatch, suspend, exit, block, unblock, and reap. Uh, and I mentioned the two additional exit transitions. Uh, we can also expand on the five state model by considering the idea of disk. Uh, because the process might not be entirely in memory, specifically because users might request more things be running than actually fit in available memory. Uh, the limiting factor is not the process control blocks, they're not that big, it's the stack and the heap space of the programs. With no other place to put them, the operating system will put parts of processes on disk, and that's what's known as swapping. Uh, when demands for memory exceed the available memory, parts of processes will be moved to disk storage to make room, uh, and that is a notably expensive operation. Disk is slow compared to memory. Um, swapping is, uh, how slow is it? Well, you might recall I mentioned earlier the idea that if we have to get uh, a page from disk. It's the equivalent of having somebody walk it from the Library and Archives Canada all the way to Waterloo. It takes quite a while. So from the perspective of the CPU, it takes like seven eternities to actually write things to disk. Uh, and then if we're going to have to read that in again, it takes, uh, again, as much time to read as it took to write. So swapping is undesirable, but it will happen when it is only necessary. Uh, and the idea of that sixth state for something being swapped uh, is to make sure that the operating system knows which processes are currently in memory and ready to run and which ones are not. Ideally a process will only be swapped to disk if it's blocked uh, and it remains blocked uh, and not in main memory but of course when it's on disk it could be ready as a result of something that happened and was waiting for an IO operation to finish or was waiting for the user to press OK. Uh, or what if all processes are ready, but there's just a shortage of memory space altogether? So the seventh state will exist, uh, ready slash swapped, uh, along with blocked and swapped. So we end up with something that looks like this as your seventh state diagram for the state of the process. Uh, it is, of course, a minor variation of the five state model. Uh, and it reflects the fact that when something is blocked, it could be swapped out to disk as well as when it's ready, it could be swapped out as well uh, and could be swapped in. As before, uh, there are additional exit transitions which do exist but are not shown because it would really clutter up this diagram quite a lot. Um, but this is the, this is the basic flow that we could imagine a process will transition through while it is actually executing throughout its entire life cycle. For the most part, uh, we think in this course about you know, whether a process is ready, blocked, or running. Um, th the details about you know, it being terminated and swapped and what have you are much more handled by the operating system, and so I expect that you will revisit those kinds of things uh, in the future operating systems course, should you take one. Uh, but we we will frequently think about whether a process is blocked, uh, if we can unblock it, uh, if it is ready, uh, and uh, we have to remember that a lot of the transitions here are not controlled by us as application developers, but are controlled by the operating system. When a process that is ready is selected to run, that is a decision of the scheduler. It's nothing we can choose directly. Uh, getting blocked is usually a side effect of some system call that we want to make. We want to acquire a resource, but the resource is busy uh, or the resource is not available immediately, uh, and that ends up blocking our process. And we have to know that this could happen and be prepared to deal with it. So the variant of the five state model, it just changes with the admit transition. So it says by default, the new process doesn't start in memory because it does take some work to actually load the executable and get it started. Uh, and we added our swap in and swap out transitions as well as uh, another unblock. Uh, and as in the five state model, there are those additional exit transitions that move it to the terminated state uh, from basically anywhere. 
So this high-level overview of what is actually going on with the process might not seem super informative as to what's going on in Unix, um, but it is sort of some necessary background for our next topic where we're going to talk about what do processes actually look like in Unix uh, and how do we work with them and how do we use them effectively. So we'll pick that topic up over in the next video.